violence, so they've never showed you how uh, violence acts as a deterrent effect. Next, they tell you that when an individual really, really feels like the environment is harmed, that he or she needs to do what is, what is right. Ladies and gentlemen, that's exactly what Ted Kaczynski, the Unabomber, did. He yeah. wrote a tract on eco-terrorism and sent letter bombs to people. That hardly lent legitimacy to the environmental Shame. movement. Andre, go. Oh, like that. that an individual needs to do what he or she thinks is right. The Unabomber clearly thought he was right. Have a seat. <laughs> So is assassinating somebody. So let's move on to arguments. <laughs> Jesse tells you that violence is overrated because it's a bad strategic choice. You're never going to match the violence that, that the government of the United States or the government of China can perpetrate on its populations. You are always overmatched. This is something they chose not to deal with. Not at this time. Next, Jesse tells you about PETA. They tell you, I think she said the word fluffy three times in her argument, so I'm a little distracted by that. But the point is that, that this leads to polarization. That the extreme groups take away legitimacy from moderate groups, Sir. and thus in the wider society, the movement as a whole suffers. Sir. Not this time. Not this time. Next, they tell you that um, that the there that there have already been legal actions, and therefore they're only talking about when violence is a last resort. Again, uh, violence is never a last resort. There are always nonviolent options. Look to Gandhi. Look to King. These things are effective. Not at this time. Actually, okay. <laughs> Do you think that this polarization is going to be really, really serious? And do you really think that the government and the people are going to care about the polarization? You mean, I mean, the government of Somalia? Yes, polarization is what's led to war there for the last 20 years. I think they care. Next, let's talk about our third argument, not at this time. Hey, not at this time. Maybe later. Um, okay, our third argument is that violence harms the internal dynamics of any social movement. And I have three reasons why this is the case. First, it scares away allies. It scares away people who potentially would support your cause. When you, are, when you act violently, you scare away the people who might be sympathetic to your cause, but who are, who are uh, horrified by violence. Look to the Earth Liberation Front, okay? This, there, there's a reason that the Sierra Club and these moderate environmental groups distance themselves from these violent, these violent groups because they understand that in society, people view these violent groups negatively and thus would impute those viewpoints onto the larger green movement. Not at this time. I've already taken twice what you guys have taken. What about me? No. <laughs> Next. Uh, violence fragments movements. This is our second argument. Look to the Animal Liberation Front, and it's even nuttier offshoot, the armed resi the Animal Resistance Movement. Now, I'm not sure if they're giving monkeys guns. That's always a bad idea. Not at this time, please. Uh, so, w what, what happens with violence is that the game between challengers and authorities becomes one of, of legal and gradual means to one that's polarized between people who support violence and people who are against violence. Furthermore, it gives the state uh, it gives the state an excuse to repress any movements associated with that particular cause. Look to what's happening in China. Okay, Envir the environmental uh, movements, along with ethnic movements, if they perpetrate violence, they get crushed. Furthermore, the state media can spin, uh, spin the, the, the movement however they want because there's a lack of freedom of speech. So violence inherently harms social movements in the largest country on the planet and the second highest CO2 em emitter on the planet. So if they want to show you that we can violently take down the, the Chinese government and make it you know, uh, uh, some sort of green utopia, that's their burden, but I don't think they can do it. The third reason why uh, violence harms the internal dyna dynamics of movements is that it's harder to marshal resources. When a group goes on the FBI terrorism list, all of a sudden their bank accounts are frozen. All of a sudden people don't want to donate to them because it's illegal. So it's much harder to marshal resources for a global environmental movement when you have terrorists within that movement. Ladies and gentlemen, I believe I've successfully shown you how acts of violence to protect the environment are not justified. To thank the member Kaczynski and call on the second first speaker for the second government, Sharmila, to explain to us why we should move beyond Fluffy. Yeah. Good evening, everyone. It's kind of rich that we have team.
Latino America talking about violence as the super last resort. But anyway, it's important in this debate to be comparative. Of course, neither situation is ideal, and it's very, very unlikely that we're going to win this environmental battle completely successfully in the near future. But we have to compare. Let's talk about the protests. Let's talk about lawsuits. Let's talk about writing to your congressman. Do these things really work? There are two rebuttals I want to deal with before I move on to my constructive in today's debate. Number one is the assertion that violence is never the last resort. Maybe if you're willing to wait forever, then you'll have other options. But the problem is, you are facing time constraints when you're dealing with environmental issues because the damage is irreversible. And you have to factor in this particular element when considering your options. And that's when violence becomes more necessary and more justified. Maybe as not the lastest resort, but the legitimate last resort. Second thing I want to deal with is this argument that very cursorily, because this is my constructive, that violence creates fractions among social movements and alienates potential supporters. Let's talk about Gandhi and King. The element of violent um, elements of their broader movement actually helped them because it helped them position themselves as the people who would protect uh, society from the threat of further alienation and that's why state actors engaged them precisely because the threat of violence created space for them. Without that threat, they would have been dismissed, they would have been ignored because they were structurally disadvantaged in the first place. Let's talk about China. They themselves say that China does not respect basic freedoms. So where is protest going to get you? Where is writing to your congressmen or you know leaders going to get you at the end of the day? Obviously, you have to be comparative. And there's still, there's still more to gain from violence. It's not an ideal situation, but it's about marginal gains in certain um, situations. So basically, what I want to talk to you about today is how violence is essential for the sustainability of the broader environmental struggle. And I want to talk about how it's an effective approach directly clashing with the um, opening opposition team. So let's look at the environmental movement in a while and ask, where are they right now? We agree, the environmental movement has been able to generate some awareness about their cause. Yay! People now know about global warming, people now know about the harms of a carbon-based economy. In a while, please sit down, but let's analyze the quality and character of this particular awareness. And this is where we want to bring in the idea of big business because it's been largely neglected in this debate and we've just really been talking about the government. If you look at the dynamic between big business and the environment, their, their interests are fundamentally irreconcilable. You know, this logic of consumerism and capitalism is about creating more needs and more wants and lots of waste. There's really no way to reconcile the environmental movement with them. So let's look at how the environmental agenda today has been appropriated or accommodated. It's basically been co-opted by big business. There's no fundamental overhaul. There's no fundamental change. What you see is token sound bitey modifications that's been introduced. What you see is corporate social responsibility that doesn't really do anything sustainable. So what we have it's a feel-good, pop, vanilla kind of environmentalism that everyone's comfortable with and we think we're doing our share. That's why there's a need to keep sustaining the 